Recently, there have been lots of controversies about the status of Christianity and whether it is liberal, conservative, modernist, traditionalist, universalist, or particularist. There are many different criticisms that have been levied against Christianity, but ultimately they mostly boil down to either saying that Christianity is at fault for the present condition of the West, or, at the very least, that it is powerless to resist the social changes that has occurred, and it's powerless to protect traditional social values. Academic agent is one such figure that has been making these types of criticisms of Christianity. In one recent quote tweet, he responded to a tweet which had a picture of a church with a pride flag and a BLM banner. He said, Responses once again demonstrate the non-viability of Christian nationalism as left and right quote Bible verses at each other as if they were playing Magic the Gathering cards. On one hand, I suppose that this tweet isn't even one which I am the intended target audience for, because I'm not even a Christian nationalist to begin with. Now is not really the time for me to give my extended thoughts on that topic. But after having watched several reviews of the recent books that have come out advocating Christian nationalism, and also having watched several discussions about the topic, I find it to be so incredibly vague that it possesses no use whatsoever. Beyond that, I'm also not a nationalist of any type, and I'm sure that will annoy some people, but that's also a discussion for another time. There is also a sense in which it might make sense to say that I agree with AA here. After all, the classic Catholic criticism of Protestantism is that without a single institutional authority, agreement among Christendom is impossible and theological disputes will inevitably lead to further and further division. I do, of course, agree with this classic criticism of Protestantism, but I think as a response to the point that AA was rising, it actually misses the point. That is because if I were to say that this is just a problem of Protestantism causing inward division, then that presupposes that this is just another classic inter-Christian debate based on an inability of both sides to come to a common interpretation of mutually agreed upon Christian sources. That is more or less the way that debates within Christendom have occurred over the past 500 years. There was a fundamental agreement upon a source, that is, the Bible, but different views on what the correct interpretation of the Bible is. Traditionally, all Christians on all sides agreed that the Bible was inspired and infallible. Those terms are not synonyms. Infallible means that the Bible does not and cannot err, because God cannot and does not deceive. Inspired means, as Dr. Lawrence Feingold explains, God is its primary and principal author, and therefore scripture is rightly said to be the word of God in an exclusive sense. It is God's word because he inspired its composition in such a way that the human author, using his faculties under the influence of divine grace, wrote what God wished him to write, only that and nothing more. But in the Catholic-Protestant debate, the issue that also looms is the issue of hermeneutics, that is, the theory by which scripture should be understood. Catholics believe that in addition to sacred scripture, there is also unwritten oral tradition that is passed down by Christ and the apostles, and is also equally infallible and inspired. In addition, Catholics also believe that we have an institutional church which was directly and personally founded by Jesus Christ and its doctrine is protected by him to this day. Protestants, of course, do not agree with either of these things, the existence of an unwritten tradition nor the direct establishment of a visible hierarchical institutional church. And thus, that means that both Catholics and Protestants have different hermeneutics, that is, different frameworks by which they view the Bible, and this, in part, results in our differing interpretations. Also important to note is that, of course, over the past 500 years, there has been many debates within Protestantism about what the correct interpretation of Scripture is. And such debates are even closer together than the Catholic-Protestant debates, since they hold the same basic understanding of authority. My goal in explaining all of that is not to defend the Catholic view, nor to try to refute the Protestant view, it is only to explain the basic historic Catholic-Protestant debate, so we can compare it to the modern issue of liberal Christianity. Is the debate between liberal and conservative Christians the same as either the 
inter-Protestant debate where there's agreement on the central authority, or even the Catholic-Protestant debates where there is disagreement on some issues of authority, but there is at least one shared authority that both sides have the same basic view of. In short, is the reason that a liberal Christian believes that sodomy is good because they found a verse in the Bible which compels them to accept the goodness of sodomy, and because they believe that the verses that are understood to condemn sodomy do not actually do so? To answer this, we need to take a step back, far before the modern debates on sexual morality, and look at the origins of liberal Christianity. Now, determining when exactly liberal Christianity started is controversial, difficult, and beyond the scope of this video. But by the late 1700s, there were some events that were extremely important to, if not its origin, then at least the development of liberal Christianity. This was the creation of historical criticism. Historical criticism is a method of analyzing historical documents with an aim at either trying to discover what the original text was or the original meaning of the text. This was not initially applied to the Bible, but it didn't take long for it to get there. Using the historical critical method, scholars claimed that many figures such as Homer, who had previously been believed to be historical figures, were actually myths. It's not very surprising that when these same scholars applied historical criticism to the Bible, they arrived at the same conclusion. One of the most prominent examples of this was David Strauss, a German Protestant who published a four-volume series called The Life of Jesus Critically Examined. In this, he claimed to discover the historical Jesus and that much of what we knew about Jesus from the Gospels was just myth, in particular, the stories of miracles. One might naturally ask, what exactly was Strauss's source for this claim? Did he discover new documents that were older and more reliable? Did he find secular accounts of the life of Christ from Jesus' own time? Did he find an older version of the gospel that's radically different from the ones that we have today? No, he did not do any of those things, because no such documents exist. Rather, this is not at all a question of any new sources, but rather a new approach to the old source, the same sacred scripture. In The Life of Jesus, Strauss explains his two primary rules by which he will explain who the real historical Jesus was. I can explain the second rule more concisely, so I'll start with that one. It was that if something in the Gospels contradicted something else in the Gospels, then that must be either an error or there must be some element of myth or legend. This might seem like a reasonable presupposition, but this is based on a denial of what I have already previously outlined as one of the most important foundational Christian beliefs, that is, that the Bible is infallible and inspired. So, from the beginning, he is simply assuming that this principle is false. He has no new information to prove that these are actually contradictions. All the alleged contradictions are things which literate, well-educated Christians had been aware of for the 1800 years before the life of Strauss, and thus had evidently been able to reconcile without abandoning biblical infallibility. The first principle he sets forth for finding the historical Jesus is even more extreme. He simply declares that miracles cannot happen because the laws of the universe cannot be broken, and thus anything in the Gospels that describes a miracle must be a myth or a legend. This is, of course, at best deism, if not outright atheism, and again is just importing a foreign worldview onto the text. He has also, of course, not proven anything. He is just assuming that Christianity, as it always has been understood, is false. And from that, he tries to explain the life of Jesus with that presupposition. I know this position sounds absurdly self-referential, so I will quote David Strauss at length to show that what I have explained is precisely his position. An account is not historical, that the matter related could not have taken place in the manner described is evident. First, the narration is irreconcilable with the known and universal laws which govern the course of events. Now, according to these laws, agreeing with all just philosophical conceptions and all credible experience, the absolute cause never disturbs the chain of secondary causes 
by single arbitrary acts of interposition, but rather manifests itself in the production of the aggregate of finite causalities, and of their reciprocal action. When, therefore, we meet with an account of certain phenomena or events of which it is either expressly stated or implied that they were produced immediately by God himself, divine apparitions, voices from heaven, and the like, or by human beings possessed of supernatural powers, miracles, prophecies, such an account is insofar to be considered as not historical and inasmuch as, in general, the intermingling of spiritual world with the human is found only in inauthentic records and is irreconcilable with all just conceptions, so narratives of angels and of devils and their appearing in human shape and interfering with human concerns cannot possibly be received as historical. In short, this position is simply dogmatic secularism, presupposing that secularism is true, and that this is an unbending dogma, and thus trying to explain everything through this presupposition, and claiming that such a presupposition is proof of a debunking of non-deistic religion. But the really relevant thing here is not just this Enlightenment attempt to attack Christianity, but that Strauss, even after this, still considered himself to be a Christian. That is the real relevance to our story today. To be clear, I am not claiming that Strauss is personally the founder of liberal Protestantism, nor was he the only figure that had these types of ideas, and later liberal Christians certainly were not always as extreme in him and his deism. But this type of historical criticism was central to the development of liberal Christianity, and Strauss was one of the most important figures in its creation. It's also very important to note here that this extreme historical criticism is not based on anything new at all. The whole allure of progressive modern Enlightenment society is claiming that we have some sort of new knowledge, that we're so advanced now and that means that we don't have those silly old beliefs that people had in olden times. Very real scientific advancements can be pointed to, and those can be equated with philosophical perversions, and it is thus implied, or sometimes outright stated, that the two have to go side by side. This is the allure that historical criticism is based on, but the reality is, everything that Strauss did is not based on any new knowledge whatsoever. There was no new discovery, scientific or philosophical, that suggested his position. It was just now asserted as true. This extreme liberal approach to the Bible and theology is present today in many mainline Protestant churches. One such example would be the Episcopal Church, the largest Anglican church in America, and one of the most prominent modern-day examples of liberal Protestantism. In an Episcopal Dictionary of the Church, which is hosted on the Episcopal Church's website, they describe their rejection of biblical inerrancy as such. The belief that the Bible contains no errors, whether theological, moral, historical, or scientific. Sophisticated holders of this theory, however, stress that the biblical manuscripts as originally written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek were inerrant, but not those that are presently available. Some more conservative scholars are reluctant to speak of inerrancy, but choose to speak of biblical infallibility. They mean that the Bible is completely infallible in what it teaches about God and God's will for human salvation, but not necessarily in all its historical or scientific statements. Biblical inerrancy and infallibility are not accepted by the Episcopal Church. See Fundamentalism. The Episcopal Church even distinguishes two possible views, biblical inerrancy and biblical infallibility, and it rejects them both. I have been able to talk about all this without referring thus far to the issues of controversial moral questions that this video started by discussing. That is because it's a mistake to think that the debate between Christians on issues like sodomy or abortion are simply another theological debate just like, say, the debates between Catholics and Protestants on justification, or the debates between Arminians and Calvinists on predestination. 
because in both of those cases, there is the same basic agreement on the authority of a shared source, as I previously discussed. This agreement does not exist between liberal and conservative Christians. Thus, the reason that they believe sodomy is okay and they fly gay pride flags is not simply because they think that they have found a way to make Romans 1 read in a way which does not affirm the sinfulness of sodomy. It is because they think that Romans 1 could be wrong, but they just wouldn't care. Therefore, the principal disagreement here is hermeneutics, but to a far more extreme degree than the classical Protestant-Catholic debates, because, at least in that case, there was a shared source. One such example of this would be an article by Candice Shalou, a female lesbian pastor in the United Church of Christ. In an article on the issue of biblical inerrancy, she said, Believing the Bible to be inerrant, to me, is idol worship. You worship the Bible more than you worship God. I am guided by the Holy Spirit. I am in love with the living God that is bigger than any Bible, any creed, any church, any ceremony. Thus, arguing biblical exegesis with her is beside the point. Another example of this would be the book chapter in the New Cambridge Companion to Biblical Interpretation. The chapter is called LGBTI slash Queer Interpretations, written by Ken Stone, a member of the United Church of Christ. In that chapter, he details many LGBT interpretations and interpreters of scripture. He does briefly note that many such interpreters might claim that the passages that condemn sodomy might not actually do so, but he goes into far more detail explaining interpretations of scripture that do not necessarily rely on that. For example, in much of the chapter, he explains that many authors believe that scripture is, as was the Roman world in general, primarily concerned with the active and passive partner, not the sex of the partner. In same-sex relationships, thus, the passive is considered, according to these authors, shamed by the act, and the active was not. Needless to say, they do not advance this theory because they think this is the correct view of sexuality. They do so because they want to say that the biblical view of sexuality is just wrong, and that since conservative Christians disagree with this view, then they should just disagree with the Bible on sex. Stone also discusses an interpretation from a Jewish lady, so not a Christian in this case, but I think the basic principles are the same in this case. And the interpretation that she gives is of the Book of Ruth and a lesbian reading she gives to it. She does not actually claim that the Book of Ruth is actually lesbian, She just claims that lesbians can easily see themselves in the story. Once again, the actual truth of what the author intended to convey is not something that the interpreters are particularly concerned with. Again, the hermeneutics could not possibly be more different. My final and perhaps most instructive example is that of a dialogue that took place between a gay liberal evangelical pastor, Brandon Robinson, and a Catholic apologist, Trent Horn. They talked for almost two hours, and mostly on the issue of what sexual acts were permissible for Christians, and for much of the discussion, he defended interpretations of the passages that condemn sodomy as meaning something else. He also argued that the traditional condemnations of those acts must be false because such condemnations have bad social consequences. But very late in the discussion, the real issue comes out when he says the following. I take the view that I have a lower view of scripture, first of all. We haven't articulated that on this podcast yet, but I don't believe in an inerrancy. I wouldn't hold to those views. I have a view that the Bible is a book created by humans, that God has spoken through faithfully for generations, but it contains errors and I think that Paul is a man of his time. Once again, his view is completely different from the Christian view. It is important to emphasize again the order that this occurred in. David Strauss, I'm sure, would have held, by modern standards, very conservative views on sexuality, since almost anyone during his time period would have. What came first chronologically was the abandonment of the Christian view of scripture. Then came the abandonment of the Christian view on certain moral issues. 
Now, to draw this all back to the beginning, the reason why what academic agents said is wrong is because leftists, even leftist Christians, are not usually even claiming to get their views of sexuality from the Bible. Is it true that Christian political organization will hold no appeal to members of the pride flag churches? Of course, but no form of right-wing nor socially conservative political organization will capture them because they have already made their primary source of doctrine leftism, not Christianity. No form of political organization will make them the allies of the right without that first being converted. And that is just as true no matter what type of right-wing beliefs you hold. Thank you everyone very much for watching this video. Please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell. And most importantly, submit to the Holy Roman Pontiff, which is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature. And a special thanks to my donors. God save the King.